All right, welcome everyone and thank you for attending. This is another PLS author presentation and we've got a great presentation today of a really interesting uh, article that was published in the spring issue of PLS in 2020. And I think it's actually very pertinent given, give, given all the things that are going on uh, with COVID these days. So we've got our, pre our presenters on politics of, and trust in Ebola vaccine trials, the case of Ghana. It's going to be presented by Wes Schramm and John Agri. Wes is, Wes's research focuses on sociology of science and technology. And John's research focuses on so sociology of health, infectious diseases, and disasters. So I'm very much looking forward to um, their presentation today and learn a little bit more, more about this very um, interesting and important topic. Wes, I will turn it over to you since you said you were going to start, sir. And Wes, you are muted. Let me see if I can unmute you just a second. I appreciate it. And I, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I think it's a great program that you've got going here. I, I think I I'm not going to share a PowerPoint. It's it's. Um, I'll talk for a few minutes, but I, but I'm going to sort of give the big picture on the project and and how how we got into this um, this uh, mess in in Ghana, and uh, it's it's now. I think I should say I, I never wanted to study infectious diseases. I still don't want to study infectious diseases. I now have two grants to do a 10 country study of COVID and another one to do a four country study of COVID. And here we are, you know, uh, but believe me, I, I really like studying communications technology in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's my thing, and social networks. So, um, so as soon as I can get off of infectious disease, I'll be very happy. But at the moment, um, it's an important topic and what was happening in 2014, uh, we were, I, I was on my way from, I, I normally spend my summers in Kenya and Ghana for the last 26 years, that's what I've been doing. And I was on my way from Kenya to Ghana to, to do a project there and had a student, this is before I ever met John, had a student who was looking at internet cafes in Ghana and he was going from one to another doing interviews. And I started getting messages from him, this is in summer of 2014, about Ebola and how it was getting pretty worrisome. Um, and one day I was, I was out in the middle of Kenya driving somewhere and I kind of lost the connection that, and I didn't get any text messages or emails for a while. I got to a, a, a town and received text messages from him saying, Wes, don't come to Ghana. It's too dangerous. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm gonna hear from you, but I'm really gonna get on the next plane out of here. And of course I didn't get the message in time. And then he said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to the airport now. I can't, I can't take it anymore. It's too dangerous. I'm seeing spots on my hands. Uh, I, I don't know. I just, I just got to get out. I think it's going to be like a Category Five hurricane in Ghana. So, so well, you know, by that time it was too late. But I went to Ghana, and he wasn't, he wasn't. Well, he was wrong. He was, he was wrong. It wasn't a Category Five hurricane. In fact, now or ever, I think we can all say that there were no. I think, I think John can say more about this if he wants. But I don't believe there was ever a single case of Ebola in Ghana. Nonetheless, people thought there would be or were, and definitely people thought that the hospitals were concealing them. And, and so that was the summer I kind of spent. I, I knew what this other student was thinking about because I was spending ever more time in my hotel room. You know, I would go out and then I would say, no, I think I, I, think I need to, 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 to lay low here. And you know, pretty soon I was kind of the same way. Uh, then I, got, I came back to Baton Rouge and exactly the same happened. Same thing happened. There were never any cases of Ebola in Baton Rouge, but people were talking about it. And people were saying, you know, there's a rumor that we already have cases of Ebola, but the authorities don't want to say anything about it. And then there's a rumor, a doctor is, is injecting 
patients with a sermon, giving them Ebola intentionally. This is in Louisiana now, this is not in Ghana. So, you know, the whole thing got out of control for a while and about a year later, uh, you know, that was, things were under control and uh, we, we got a, a project uh, to study this and, and John will um, be speaking more about that. And I think what I wanna do is just introduce two concepts that, that are, have been useful for us in studying not only Ebola, but also Zika, which came immediately afterwards, but mostly in Latin America, but there were also a lot of cases in the United States and still are. And then now with coronavirus, it's become even more obvious. And I would, I would submit to you for discussion that these concepts are quite useful in thinking about coronavirus. So that's, that's kind of where I'm headed on this, the connection between Ebola and coronavirus. And uh, one, one of the concepts, as we call it, we call it uh, epidemic fire. And the, the idea is that in the modern world, in the modern world, epidemics are, are not simply the presence of disease agents, that is viruses or uh, bacteria or other kinds of things. They're, they're, they're not to be thought of or not best thought of as, as viewing them as, as, the, as just uh, a, an outbreak or, a, or an in, a, a sudden increase in the in occurrence of a certain type of infections. That, that's, that's sort of the main point. What, what they are, they're better thought of uh, as not only an infectious disease agent, almost always invisible, uh, but as epidemics of information. In other words, you come into contact with information nuggets, whatever you want, want to call them. You come into contact with these, these, these bits of information, you discuss them with your friends, and then some kind of fear or panic even at the extreme can, can occur where, where everyone is exchanging information, trying to get information from the internet, from so social media, from various sources. And this really does affect our behavior in a very serious way. And th these things really do exist. There, there really was an epidemic of Ebola, both in Ghana and Louisiana. There was just no Ebola as far as an infectious disease agent. The virus didn't, didn't come in either, either place. So that's one of the, one of the idea. And the other um, idea is the concept of fear that we developed during the last few years. And the best way to, uh, not very many people know the word locative. It comes from, it's a Latin term. And it's, it's, a, it's if you think of location, locative is a term referencing a location. Uh, the Latin term is L-O-C-A-T-I-V-E. And a locative is a part of speech that refers to something in relation to space. So if you say, uh, he's behind me, behind is a locative term. Or if I say to the right of, or in front of, or you know any of those terms are locative terms. And so we started using the idea because in, in all of our interviews, and John will talk about this, the fear narrative is very, very prominent, very, very prominent. It's different in Ebola and Corona uh, because Ebola is so much more frightening in, in, and so much more likely to kill you if you get it. But the, the idea is fear can be locative. And so we say locative fear, which refers to uh, not just fear of the disease agent itself, like the, the, the Ebola virus or the coronavirus. That's, you know, you can be afraid of those, but you also begin to fear things that can't be seen. So locative fear, and, and this, is, this is present for both Ebola and corona, locative fear includes the fear of empty spaces 
And it includes the fear of asymptomatic people. In other words, it, it, when, you, when you really get into a, uh, the situation of locative fear, you, you start to think about, well, I don't know, really know if I should go out because you know, if I do go out, you know, I don't really know who's been there. And you know, even though the room is empty, I think some people were here just before me and there could be droplets. There could be droplets if I touch them and I get it in my face, I may get sick. Or you know, with Ebola, I might start bleeding from my eyeballs or whatever. But you know, the idea is that you're fearing an empty space because you don't know who has been there and whether they might have been sick. Okay, but you're also fearing asymptomatic people, people who don't look sick, who don't appear sick, but they may be on the way to getting sick and they be infectious. Or you know, maybe they maybe they got the type of coronavirus where. You just don't have symptoms ever, and you never really know that you're sick, but you actually are infectious. So that is locative fear. And I think it's, as I say, it's relevant to um, what we're experiencing today um, as well. Uh, but but if, if you wanna consider those, those two ideas, uh, one is the idea of the, the kind of uh, e epidemics are outbreaks of information as well as outbreaks of, of an infectious uh, agent um, and and they cause this sort of fear of empty spaces um, and we're we're now you know really since uh, the Ebola outbreak we had Ebola we have Zika now we've got coronavirus we're almost in a permanent epidemic state these days and I think I want to end it there um, and and uh, introduce John Agri who's um, uh, got some very interesting uh, experiences in Ghana and he, he is from from Ghana as well. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Wes, uh, for that. So, as you rightly said, the element of fear is prominent in an um, emerging infectious disease uh, context. And that was the context within which the planned uh, vaccine trials um, occurred in Ghana, because um, people were aware of Ebola and then um, the associated fear of they coming into contact with the disease, you know, in the case of being uh, infected at some point in one way or, or or, or, or the other. And then um, in, in this context of fear, they were also aware of the uh, presence of the disease in other locations. But then principally what happened for the people of Ghana is the fact that why would the government allow a pharmaceutical company to come to Ghana to try to carry out a vaccine trial for a deadly disease like uh, uh, Ebola. For them, it beat their imagination. It was unfathomable for them. You know, Ebola is deadly. If you come to contact with it, you're going to die. Those were the characteristics they made reference to any time they spoke, they spoke about, about the disease. So for the respondent, for the government to go ahead with that meant the government was up to no good. You know, they simply wanted uh, uh, people to, to die. And for some of them, vaccine trials meant this. Vaccine trial meant introducing the disease element, in this case, the Ebola virus to the population and then treating it with an uncertified vaccine to test its efficacy. So then it meant the scientists were also equally um, up to, up to uh, uh, no good. Um, the other element connected to fear was, there's a conflation of risk where they associated the risk of the disease with the risk of the vaccine trial itself. They couldn't you know, separate the two. So for them, it made, them, it made it difficult for them to trust the regulatory institutions to regulate the activities of the scientists uh, to ensure their safety. And um, a common narrative among the community members was that um, the only way the vaccine trials, the planned vaccine trials were going to take place was for the scientists to have paid the politicians to grant them access to the community, for um, the scientists to have paid the regulatory authorities, you know, to grant them um, the regulatory approvals for them to, 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 go, to go ahead with it. The interesting thing in the Ghana case is the planned site for the vaccine trial, Hohoi, it's a site that is not new to vaccine, trial, vaccine trials or clinical trials. It, has, it houses Ghana's um, Onkosekaisis um, Chemotherapy Research uh, Center where they've had vaccine trials, clinical trials for malaria, for Onkosekaisis. There was no issue, there was no pushback from the community. Uh, they trusted the scientists and all that. But then when it came to Ebola, because of the disease characteristics, the fear that accompanied the presence, or in this in Ghana's context, 
the absent presence of the disease since it wasn't, uh, th there were no recorded cases. There was that pushback, they, they couldn't just accept it. There was also the element of they feeling they are an unfair target by the government because why ho -ho, why this place and not any, in, 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 anywhere else. Um, for, for them, the official reason that because we have this research center, it's an ideal location, you know, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't enough. They, they felt the government wanted to wipe them out. But then politically, that didn't make sense because Hohoi is the stronghold of the sitting government at the time. You know, so then that didn't uh, uh, make sense. The alternate, alternative political interpretation for the vaccine trial uh, in connection with the fear was the fact that they questioned the integrity of their local leaders. They felt the, there's some kind of bribery, you know, that had taken place for them to go ahead to, to do that. So some of them took to radio stations to uh, register their displeasure. And then as part of the vaccine trials, we're going to give them tokens. So for volunteers, you'll be given, if you volunteer, you sign up for it, you take the candidate vaccine, you'll be given um, a mobile phone, which the clinicians explained that it was going to be used to call the center in case of an emergency and uh, an amount of 200 Ghana cities, which is the equivalent of about $50, you know, for time lost in taking part in the trials. It was termed as uh, lost earnings. But then for community members, that was to lure them to participate in a deadly vaccine trial. And it made the vaccine trial all the more suspicious. You know, so we see right there in these dynamics that the disease characteristics kind of generated fear. It impacted the trust relationships between the uh, scientists and the community members. The disease also became a political disease. You know, in, in a radio interview, the lead scientist described Ebola as a political disease in explaining his frustration in getting regulatory uh, approval. And for the disease discourse to adopt Ebola, you know, uh, into a kind of a strategic political action was, was something that was of, of interest uh, to us because then we realized that the character of the disease as a political disease in this case, was negotiated by the various um, actors in the vaccine trial network. So by the parliamentarians, the uh, FDA, the Ghana's FDA, uh, the scientists and, and all that. Each of them had to negotiate that. So the scientists in trying to develop a vaccine to contain Ebola, they had to negotiate the uh, political character of the disease with other, other, other actors. And um, another feature was the fact that the disease became a disease of contention in that the opposition political party criticized government for abandoning the political, the economic needs of Ghanaians and full focusing on Ebola, all because the government decided to make Accra Ghana's capital the hub of United Nations uh, missions for Ebola response, emergency response. The sitting government also criticized the opposition party for being so desperate for power that they will use Ebola as a tool for propaganda to discredit the, the, the sitting government. The actions of these actors, you know, and then uh, the way they used Ebola, the Ebola discourse as a common currency of um, vilification, uh, vilification in, the, in the face of the absence of, of the disease was also uh, quite interesting uh, uh, for us. In all of this, we, we start to understand one simple question. Why did the vaccine trials fail in Ghana? You know, and so we explore the trust relationships between scientists, volunteers, scientists, and the regulatory institutions. And um, our argument is vaccine trials takes place in a milieu of trust. And our analysis is premised on the assumption that this milieu of trust occurs in a political context. And this political context affects the relationships that are forged, you know, in the uh, vaccine trials fail for numerous reasons. Um, funds, uh, trials that are underfunded, um, if the um, characteristics of the patient population do not match the characteristics of the enrolling population, it will lead to um, inappropriate trial population, so the vaccine trial can fail. If you have inadequate enrollment, the vaccine trial can fail as well. But then we argue that these, I mean, the, the underlying assumption is if you have a well-planned protocol, which is well-funded, the vaccine trial should be successful. But then we argue that these characteristics or these factors 
alone do not guarantee the success of uh, vaccine trials. Um, the, the political context you know, is also crucial to determining the, the success of, of, of the uh, vaccine, vaccine trials. And then it's the disease characteristics and the political context of the trial site, which are key in the, in the uh, success of these vaccine trials, especially vaccine trials for uh, emerging infectious uh, diseases. To explore these relationships, we use the concept of tandem developed by uh, Biker and his colleagues, where they talk of the concept of tandems as uh, the mutual relationship between trust and control, trust and control existing between scientists. So the scientists trust regulatory authority to grant them approval. Regulatory authority trust scientists to abide by the ethics of their research, abide by the protocol and all that. There's a trust and control element between the scientists and the volunteers. The scientists trust volunteers to willingly participate, to go by all that they need to do. And in turn, the volunteers trust the scientists to also be professional, go by the um, ethics of the research, and then uh, and do not harm them in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, process. Now, what we realized is if we look at these connections, the scientists, the regulatory institutions, the scientists, the volunteers. Um, in the vaccine trial network, these are kind of players or actors. We also employ the concept of an actor from actor network theory, where actors are principally human and non-human elements who are made active, who are enabled by these networks. You know, so in the Ebola vaccine trial network, we have the regulatory institutions, we have the scientists, we have the volunteers, we have um, uh, the disease itself, we have the research facility, we have the media and all that. When you look at this connection between these actors, with the presence of the disease, and especially the disease characteristics, a new actor is enrolled. And in this, in the, in the Ghanaian context, it was parliament. Because at the time the story broke, Ghanaians uh, were really concerned about it. There's a lot of debates, there's a lot of fights on radio, uh, news media and all that. Parliament intervened and suspended the vaccine trials, you know, based on consent on the concerns of Ghanaians, media reportage, and the characteristics of the disease. Now, by suspending that, it fractures the relationship between the scientists and the uh, regulatory institutions to the point that the principal investigator and minister of health were hauled to Parliament to answer questions. You know, the presence of the disease with its characteristics in this context also fractures the relationship between the scientists and the volunteers, you know, where in previous clinical trials, there had been some trust element, but then the presence of Ebola with its characteristics, the fear element that comes with it, breaks that trust relationship and that people were not uh, willing to enroll in this, in this vaccine uh, trial. Um, we, we, we basically argue that what we saw in Ghana was as a result of inadequate information on the vaccine trials. So this led to heightened fear among people and that eroded the trust of uh, Ghanaians with regards to the vaccine trial process and the scientists. What played out in the designated sites wasn't just a local problem. The involvement of uh, national politicians, you know, who sought to take advantage of this, of the whole dynamics, eroded the trust element embedded in uh, clinical trials. Also, the involvement of political actors in something that ordinarily would have been a regulatory process made the whole situation worse, where their presence led to the belief that there's some bribery involved. It raised questions about the choice of the site. And um, all of these affected the trust element in, in this. So then our basic uh, theory from this is that, is that disease characteristics in a political context are crucial to the design and implementation of vaccine trials, especially vaccine trials for emerging infectious uh, diseases. And this has implications for the design for um, vaccine trials itself, where the characters of the disease should not be limited to the lab, where it determines the kind of interaction scientists have with the causative organism, but then it should be factored into the design and implementation of the trial itself. It also has implications for uh, vaccine communication. You know, that should be factored into it. It should be an interactive process. That starts way ahead of time in the planning stages where there's an active engagement between the scientists, the volunteers, the community, where they address the fears, the concerns of, of, of people. 
a negotiate risk element to get people to enroll um, in the in the in, in the vaccine trial. So basically, that is what the study is about, and that is what we sought to explore um, um, at the time. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Wes and John. Let me go on ahead, and we're about 11.25 right now or so. Let me, I have some, yes, we've got some clapping going on. Thank, thank you, Caitlin. Um, let's, let me go on ahead and open the floor up for folks if you would like to have some questions. I actually have some questions, uh, but I'd certainly like to let the guests, uh, our, our visitors, take a shot first. So who has some questions if you want to raise your hand or just kind of jump right in? Either of those is fine. And I will also open the chat, by the way, so I can see if people are chatting things. I have some questions, too. Oh, you got All right. Well, do you want to do you want to start with us? Go ahead. Well, you know, uh, just uh, Speaking, speaking to my co-author, you know, uh, well, you know, John, now that we've been through Corona, you know, or, or at least uh, most of the way through, hopefully, um, I just, you know, wonder now, I, I don't really remember when the paper was finished, but it was well before I think we knew about this. So is there anything that you feel now that you would want to rethink you know, in the light of what we learned about the new epidemic, whether, you know, I have the, the, two, the two thoughts that I have about it are, are this idea of inadequate information. Boy, it just has so many levels of meaning now. It just, you know, the, it, it, inadequate is not even an adequate word for the, uh, the, the inadequacies, maybe. You know, and then the second thing that I wonder about is, you know, that, that was like a sort of a defined community where that was going to be held. And I could be wrong about this, but I think the corona vaccine trials are kind of widespread. You know, they're not, they're not in a single community. They're sort of like spread out all over the place. I, I, I could be wrong about that. But anyway, is there anything you, you think that you would want to rethink? On yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the um, right is that the um, vaccine trials for coronavirus are spread um, all, all over the place. Um, one distinguishing feature is, again, with the Ebola context, we, we spoke greatly about the characteristics of, of the disease. You know, it is different in the case of Corona. So definitely it's, it pushes us to think differently about Corona. Um, one, in terms of infection rate, it's just about the same. It spreads rapidly like Ebola did. But then in terms of the virulence it's unleashes into the human body or the patient it is not on the same scale you know and so when it comes to fear on that scale with with with, with corona it, it, it is not um kind of exactly the same so then that pushes us to think again about the dynamics of how these uh, vaccine trials are going you know but then, like what you rightly said, there's inadequate information. This information also uh, plays a role. Uh, it's a great feature with this current um, uh, disease, disease uh, with, with, with Corona, where that impacts not just the uh, vaccine trial process, but then the vaccine up, uh, uptake as well. You know, so we're thinking how uh, information affects the coronavirus situation and how we can get people to um, take, take, take the back, vaccines. Um, those are things that I would kind of, um, new dynamics that would make me really think how Corona is playing out, you know, and then um, the issue of fear also plays out differently. In the initial stages, um, where we, we, we barely knew what coronavirus was all about, so there was a heightened fear, people wondered what it was. But now that we have a lot of information, it's kind of, uh, of course, there are still concerns, you know, ab about that. Uh, but then um, again, it also calls for a rethink of what fear means like in the corona context. You know, granted that there are different char disease characteristics and it's playing out differently. Okay. Well, we wait for other questions. I'd like to, I'd let me at least ask one question that I had. So um, for either John or Wes, 
You mentioned the breakdown in trust between the volunteers and the scientists. I'm wondering about the role of trust between the volunteers and the regulators or the government. And um, I'm sure, you know, that that was a big role too. What do you do you think the biggest where was the biggest betrayal or concern about trust between the volunteers and the scientists or the volunteers and the government? In y'all's uh, opinions. Yeah, in, in, in the Ghana context, the biggest betrayal was between the volunteers and, and the government and their local leaders because uh, there was no way the scientists would have access to their community without approval of the government leaders or their local leaders. There was no way they would go ahead with a planned vaccine trial without the approval of the regulatory institution. So that was the biggest betrayal. And for the community, they, like I mentioned, it was a stronghold of the ruling party at the time. So how can we be members of the same party? And then you, that you are leaders were supposed to protect us, we give access to such people to come to our community to carry out uh, such a vaccine trial for, for Ebola. So then that, that is where the greatest betrayal uh, is. Do you think the distrust, was the distrust between the, uh, between the two comparable? In other words, um, you know, they could have sort of distrusted the government and really distrusted the scientists or vice versa. But if the initial, you know, if the initial concern with, was, was with the government, that might have driven the whole, that process to a large degree. Do you have any sense of that? Yeah, I think it was largely with, with, the, with the government. Uh, okay. They are not new to the scientists. Like I mentioned, there's a research facility where they've had clinical trials in the past. So, um, they are not used to the whole vaccine trial, clinical trial process. They have that trust relationship with the scientists. Uh, the biggest betrayal is with the uh, government and their leaders, and then which kind of spurs off, it goes off to uh, the uh, scientists. Um, and uh, with regards to the scientists, it's more of, you know, this disease is dangerous. If you want to do a trial, go to the epicenter of the outbreak, don't bring it to the community. So then once you want to do it in the community, it means you have to know good. Even though we trusted you in the past, we're not going to trust you with this one. Gotcha. I, I guess as a political scientist, I'm glad to hear there was more concern with the government than the scientists, because I'm a scientist too. So <laughs> I guess that works out that way. I don't know. Uh, what other questions? We have any other questions out there? I've actually got more I can ask, but I don't want to, I don't want to um, take up all the time. You know, this thing is still happening with the coronavirus as well. Even yesterday, somebody said to me, just, well, I guess he had had it. He, he had had coronavirus recently and it wasn't, it wasn't too bad, but I said, well, so do you still get the vaccine? And he said, no, I said, he said, you can get it if you want to, but you know, after all, they are really just giving you the, the coronavirus, which is not really, not actually true. But that was his view, and you know, he has the right right to that view. So he's just he's just not right. So you know, it, and now you know, this is one of the things that was happening with Ebola, right, John? They were yeah. saying people would say, "Yeah, they're giving you Ebola." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that was was that a function of just a complete breakdown of communication from the scientists? in the government or was there <clears throat> an unusually high resistance among the people? I, I mean, because there's, there's sort of two sides of this. There's like a lack of communication and, and the message doesn't get through because of that or, <clears throat> or and, I guess another alternative is there's a lot of messaging going out, but the resistance to it is such that uh, it's just not getting through. What's your sense of that? No, I think in the Ebola context, it was more of um, an unplanned communication. So the scientists were seeking, they had submitted their protocol to, to Ghana's FDA for approval. 
uh, they had given them conditional approval to start recruiting volunteers. Now, it was just about that time that the media broke the story. So prior to that point, there was no knowledge of the planned vaccine trials within the public sphere. You know, and um, that is when it just happened and everything kind of took a, a, a spiral downturn. And uh, there was a lot of messaging, maybe media publication back and forth. Uh, so that kind of distorted the whole uh, um, space where um, even though the government wanted to get the right communication ahead, people were not prepared to listen. Because as far as we're concerned, you never told us anything until the media reported it. And the, report and the reportage was such that it is something that is being planned in secret. So that kind of uh, spoiled, uh, marred everything in that space. Yeah, kind of like that idea that is that a, a, a apology isn't sincere as if it's in reaction to being caught, you know, doing something. <laughs> kind of idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, again, we got any questions from anybody? I... Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, please do. So, um, how do you feel these? pandemics have affected the progression and the prognosis of the African free trade agreement within these countries? Yeah, you mean the, the, the current pandemic or the Ebola outbreak at a time? Um, I would say most, I, I guess the most um, relevant right now would be the current pandemic. All right. Um, I mean, the, the the current African Free Trade Agreement, uh, uh, let me see, there's a free trade agreement between the African countries, you mean, or between uh, African countries and the Western countries? Uh, mostly between African countries themselves. All right, so de definitely there are issues of uh, concern when um, it, it comes, because the trade, the, one of the features of the free trade agreement would include a uh, free movement of people, you know, transaction between the spaces back and back and forth. And with the fluidity of uh, uh, the way the disease spread, the current disease spreads, it will definitely raise concerns, you know, uh, uh, for the various countries in, in, in that. It, it would impact it in, in, in uh, multiple ways. So one would be would, would that affect um, kind of now that we don't know, of course, there are, there are vaccines, but then is that going to affect how the free trade agreement is going to be uh, designed as opposed to pre-pandemic era, you know, now that we find ourselves in, in the, in the uh, pandemic era? Um, how are they going to regulate the free movement of people across national borders, you know? Um, um, our government going to put a special... Uh, measures in place to make sure everybody coming in is, 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 is free of, of COVID or not. Um, it also has impact on um, the uh, uh, trade deals that may take place. I mean, movement of goods and services have been impacted um, across the continent. So uh, these are some of the ways that it may affect uh, uh, the free trade agreement. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I should just learn to keep my microphone on. Any other questions? All right, let me ask one more then, and then, then I will leave it completely up to other folks. So it, uh, talking about the tandems of trust and control, it seems to me like to a large degree, trust is contingent upon control. Um, so if people don't believe that what's being done is not being done, being regulated or controlled properly. I think that would have a huge effect on, on trust in general. Can you talk a little bit about how trust and control um, uh, interact with each other? Yeah, so um, in the vaccine trial context, um, basically trust element is not uh, on a personal level. It's more of the social structural level where um, it springs of base, like you rightly said, of the control elements in, 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 in uh, 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 that space. Um, so volunteers will trust scientists to 
abide by the ethics of the research, principally because they believe the institution set in place is enforcing the control over the scientists to ensure that they, 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 they do that. The trust stems off of such uh, uh, control. And then um, kind of in the reverse, the scientists also trust that the uh, volunteers would uh, willingly participate. Of course, they trust them to kind of come up to it and then uh, and do that. Um, the key feature is this, where there's trust, there's some element of control, where there's control, there's some uh, element, element of, of trust. Now, in the absence of control, it becomes difficult to trust. So if there are no regulatory, uh, uh, um, say, rules or anything, it becomes difficult to trust what the scientists are up to because there's no check, there's no element to uh, kind of uh, uh, put them right in, in that sense. And then on the flip side, between the scientists and the uh, regulatory institutions, the scientists trust that the regulatory institutions will give them the necessary approvals and embedded in that some elements of, of, of control in that there's a particular way of organizing clinical trials, there's a particular way of doing their expect The regulatory authorities also go by that principle you know, so then they, they trust them in that sense. And the reverse is, is, is the same. You know, we trust the scientists to abide by the ethics of the research, and then we kind of enforce uh, control. So then that is how they feed off uh, each, each other. If there's no control, it becomes difficult to trust in this context. If there's no trust, there's no uh, control. Um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead, Maria, Maretta. Um, I was wondering, um, now that we do have a new pandemic, can you, do you think that you could use the same um, theoretical framework of trust and control to analyze why certain communities um, are opposed to the vaccine? Yeah, certainly we, we, can, we, we, we can use that. Uh, to explore the trust control element, you know, with regards to the uh, uptick of uh, the uh, current vaccination uh, uh, going on. Because there again, you have trust and control elements. So in the social space, uh, various social actors per our interactions have kind of instituted certain uh, trust relationships. So there's a trust relationship embedded in our healthcare system where we trust doctors to give us the best of care. We trust government to set the best of health system in place to kind of uh, 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 ensure that people are healthy. And in, inbuilt in that is a control system where the system kind of ensures that the right thing uh, is, is being done. Now, when we use this framing, we can begin to explore the relationship between people. It can be either between people and the health facilities at the institutional level, people and the um, uh, health workers, you know, that, that, that they uh, aim interact with. And we should also bear in mind that these interactions are not interactions taking place here and now. They are all embedded in um, um, a kind of historical dynamics and people's experiences and all that. So certainly we can use that as a framing to understand uh, the uptake of, of, of uh, current vaccines uh, going on. Thank you. All right, folks, anything else? Thank you all for your questions. Just so you know, I just chatted the YouTube, uh, the PLS YouTube channel where this, uh, this uh, video will be put up as soon as it's recorded and, and uh, edited down a little bit and that sort of thing. And um, so if you're interested in taking a look at that, we hope you will. I hope you'll share it with some, uh, some other folks who you think might be interested. Uh, there are a couple of other videos up there from these pre from these uh, from previous author presentations that you might also enjoy. So I'll take this final opportunity to thank John and Wes for their very interesting presentation on their very interesting research, a very interesting time. And um, thank you all, everybody, and thanks for coming today. Bye bye.